Hello and welcome to today's talk, Saturday the 2nd of July. Now infections are surging around the world but hospitalisations are not. And while hospitalisations are going up, the majority of the people being hospitalised are with COVID-19, not because of COVID-19, because of this incredible surge of BA4 and largely BA5 variant that we are seeing. So let's just start off with the data from the United States on this first of all. Now, this is the uh, relative proportion of variants, and it really makes quite a quite a systematic pattern there. So we've got the BA11 there dying out. Then we had the BA2 period, and this is getting progressively smaller and smaller. Uh, then the BA2-12-1 <laughs> period, and now we're in the BA4-5 period, and we see that BA4-5 are now uh, increasing quite dramatically, particularly BA5 as it's now clear that BA5 is in fact outcompeting BA4. So here we have those, uh, here we have those figures, uh, we have those figures here. So BA2 now down to 5.7% of uh, sequence cases in the United States. Um, going down, the, the BA2 12 one, 42%, but on its way down, so this one's going down. This one's going down. BA5 is going up, particularly BA4 is going up. And from the United States data, BA1 that Pfizer, for example, spent so much time developing a new vaccine for is now recorded at 0%. Delta is 0%. Others are 0%. So we see that the pandemic has completely moved on. Really quite, um, quite, quite interesting the way things have developed. Now, the resulting hospitalizations in the States were up 12% on the week. Now, how many of these are with COVID as opposed to for COVID in the United States? We don't know. But in the United Kingdom, we believe it's about two thirds are, are incidental. About 66% are with COVID and, and a minority are for COVID. Deaths in the United States, uh, 387 on a seven day average per day. This is up 20 three percent but on a relatively low number but we do notice that since january 2020 one in 327 people in the united states have in fact uh, died from covid not all but the vast majority of these being older and with significant comorbidities now let's look at the office of national statistics data here here's the uh, here's the sort of snapshot on that so we see infections are going up Hospital admissions are going up, but we'll be looking at that in a minute. Um, intensive care admissions, thankfully, remain pretty low, which is is good. So um, this is the uh, this is the graph for England here. Now this is the latest data. This came out yesterday, actually. Um, but we see the infections in England are increasing, and this is this week's data, the latest data here. Now. Um, Based on uh, what we knew from the COVID symptom tracker data, this is what we anticipated. So that, that was our anticipated increase in cases there. And that was the actual increase in cases there. So we can see that we were really uh, bang on on that. And it wasn't surprising because we got this from the COVID symptom tracker data, which is always about a week ahead. So we can see that uh, from that data, if we could see it, we can see from that data that we will have another increase next week as well because that is still going up slightly. But uh, interesting that um, it was a, we were able to predict that so uh, so accurately for, from the COVID symptom tracker data. So that was the site for that predictions based on Zoe data. Now Scotland, uh, the cases are even higher in Scotland at the moment. Um, very high cases in Scotland. So England at the moment works out at about one in 30 people are currently infected. Scotland it's one in 18. And the reason for this, well, the only reason that's been put forward for this is that more people in England had already been infected. The vaccination rates are comparable. Therefore, there was more natural immunity in England and Scotland is catching up, as it were. Not overly convinced about that because Scotland and England have been sort of higher and lower and um you know, sometimes Scotland's been higher, sometimes England's been higher. Uh, but that's the only sort of explanation we've seen for that. But Scotland, very sharp increase at the moment. And based on the COVID symptom tracker data, this will go up next week, 
getting on towards uh, the same levels that we saw with the original Omicron wave. Now, um, let's look at the way hospitalizations are panning out in England, because this is quite crucial, really, because I think I think here that the news is actually pretty good. Now, hospitals are under a lot of pressure, um, but most of the people being admitted, as we say, are incidental. They're with COVID, not from COVID. So this is patient uh, patients admitted. Now, these figures here, so 9,000 in the last seven days, but a lot of those are incidental findings. So when we look at this, for example, it looks like a fairly dramatic increase. But we think at least two thirds of these are incidental. So only a third of those are actually for COVID related disease. And as we see in the data here, um, most people are in the uh, older age group who are admitted. Although there's quite, there's quite a few people actually 18 to 64 there. But in terms of percentages of the population, we see that the older age group, particularly 85 and over, are uh, massively overrepresented as we would have expected. So patients are actually in hospital at the moment. And again, uh, we can see quite a dramatic increase, but we know that, as we said, most of these are incidental admissions. They just happen to have it when they're admitted. But intensive care wise, thankfully, we see that the increase is, well, there is an increase there, but it's it's pretty small when we look at it in the uh, in a larger context. And in fact, compared to pre-Omicron times, we see that the admissions have gone down really quite consistently, apart from this slight wave here. But basically, admissions have gone down to intensive care during the Omicron uh, period. So hospitalizations in the UK, about a third admitted for COVID, we believe, and uh, two thirds admitted with with COVID. Now, the Office for National Statistics is giving some good data on long COVID. Um, now, let's look at the symptoms of long COVID, first of all. Now, this is in the most common uh, working down the way. So weakness and tiredness is what most people are complaining of with long COVID. Next is shortness of breath then muscle aches, then trouble sleeping. And of course, you can probably relate to some of these anyway. I mean, I'm, I'm certainly tired quite often and certainly get uh, achy quite a lot of the time. Sometimes I have difficulty sleeping. So we can see that some of these are, are, are fairly vague. Headaches, of course, are common. But, but these are what people with long COVID, uh, self-reported long COVID from the Office of National Statistics are mostly reporting, although this is tied in with external academic work as well. Anyway, go down the list. Um, headache, anxiety, worry uh, as a feature of long COVID, low mood, sort of depression, loss of smell, memory, loss, confusion, not that those two necessarily go together, uh, loss of taste, cough, vertigo, dizziness, chest pain, palpitations is when there's an awareness of the heartbeat, you can feel the heart beating. Loss of appetite, sore throat, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, diarrhea, fever. So all of those as features of long COVID. And the other interesting thing that the Office for National Statistics has done is they're saying that the, all these features here. So I'm having difficulty with the technology, but they're saying they're saying all the features are more common uh, in in people in socially deprived uh, areas. And here there does seem to be a difference between the two, but this is their index here. So uh, the, the dark blue line is the most deprived and the, uh, the light blue line is the least deprived or the least affluent. But we do definitely see a trend there in that people with um, living in more deprived areas are reporting more long COVID and more symptoms of long COVID. Now, why this is, is... A bit difficult to explain, but just look at one possibility here. Um, ability to work from home. So amongst those uh, most deprived, uh, most people, 80.6% 80, 80 are unable to work from home. Whereas in more affluent areas, 62% um, are unable to work from home. So we can see that more people in more affluent areas are more able to work from home. Um, risk of developing long COVID in the most deprived areas, 11.1% after a COVID infection, whereas risk of developing long COVID symptoms um, after an infection, 8.1% in the, in the uh, more affluent areas. And again, we see, we see this difference here throughout all of the symptoms, and it really is quite consistent throughout all of those symptoms that we've listed. 
Now, obviously, I've put this whole list of symptoms here in the uh, in the description, so you can download those and read those actually in order. Now, it could be that people in more deprived areas uh, are working in more physical jobs very often, and um, that th their threshold for not being able to go to work is probably lower. Whereas if you're going to work and you're sitting in an office, um, if you're in a if you're in a more affluent area or you're an executive or something, that then then maybe there's less physical work involved. So that could influence people's likelihood of reporting long COVID. But whatever the explanation, we've got a lot of people with long COVID. We know from the figures that um, people can have this for four weeks, more than twelve weeks, and a sizable proportion have this for more than a year. So uh, definitely a, a morbidity, um, thankfully not a very low mortality, but a morbidity associated with that. And this, of course, reduces the whole economic viability of, of the nation. Now, I haven't given you any official um, cases in the United States and the United Kingdom or anywhere else today because um, we know that the, the, the testing is so intermittent and, and is poorly is poorly reported so these are infections and we know these are high from the office of national statistics data which is actually based on surveys so at the moment very high one in 18 in scotland with covid with covid actually as we speak well actually that's this was about seven eight nine ten days ago england one in 30 and we know from the covid symptom tracker data that this is actually going to be higher just remind ourselves of that graph there we know that's actually going to be higher next week how high this is going to carry on going, we don't know. It's driven by the uh, incredible ability of BA4 and BA5 to reinfect. About 12% of cases are reinfections. And of course, the majority of people that are now getting this infection have already been vaccinated as well. So a significant immune escape. There's a vaccine rollout in the UK plan for those more at risk this autumn. Uh, we know it's based on Omicron, but... Um, We've seen that we don't really have one Macron BA1 and BA2, which presumably it was based on. So uh, the efficacy of that in a population where there's already 99% or more of people that have got antibodies or have had antibodies, basically we don't know because the original research on the vaccines was done in naive populations. That was quite easy. Now, um, virtually everyone's got antibodies or has had antibodies. So... Um, we can't really apply the original research data anymore. So I think we have to say there's quite a few unknowns about the efficacy of this. So there we are. Um, BA5 surges ahead. Um, now, th th this graphic from the United States, this pattern will carry on. I don't think there's any question about that. And we'll see that BA4 and BA5 continue increasing. And we'll see that we'll also see that, um, that BA5 um, increases more than BA4 because it has a bit more immune uh, escape associated with it, but quite a neat pattern. So what's going to happen over the next few months? Presumably, based on the last few months, these variants are going to keep on changing. There's going to be high levels of repeat infection. Most of these are going to be very mild, very mild. A very small minority will be associated with severe disease and hospitalizations most of the people being admitted to hospital are incidental findings they just happen to have it when they're admitted because of the high prevalence and i'm expecting that the death rate specifically from covid will carry on going down now just before we finish um might look at this tomorrow see how we go for time australia's having a really bad flu season that means the uk is probably going to have a bad flu season this winter probably the United States, probably everywhere as well, because we very often follow uh, New Zealand and uh, cases of monkeypox, we believe, are still uh, increasing. So m more on that to come. But for today, thank you for watching.